I've got kids, and that means it's always about them. But I need support too. That's where Ollie comes in with their delightful, hardworking gummies. My partner and I can actually get a good night's sleep, so we'll both stand a chance of managing our stress responses. Even when the kids are doing parkour in the living room, discover Ollie vitamins and supplements. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Good afternoon, everyone. Laszlo Montgomery here once again. CHP episode 286 this time. Some uh, lighter fare than last topic. First, let me offer a special thanks to everyone who has so kindly donated to support me and my work and to all those who joined my elite coterie of Patreon patrons. I sure do appreciate your generous support and nice comments and notes. Someone sent me a topic suggestion recently to cover some of the worst empresses in Chinese history, of which there were quite a few, especially if you throw the uh, Dowager empresses in there. So I started to check out various sources, and then I thought, shoot, why focus on the bad? Let's do a good one. And as great empresses go, the one who's usually pointed to as one of the best was this one, Empress Jiang Sun. She was really the gold standard of what it meant to be the ultimate empress. What Confucius said Yao was, as far as who rulers of China should emulate, that's who Empress Jiang Sun was for future generations of empresses. I know Wu Zetian was the only one to ever actually rule the country as an empress, so she doesn't really count. Wu Zetian, by the way, was Empress Jiang Sun's daughter-in-law, though the two never met. Besides being the mother-in-law to Wu Zetian, she was also the mother to the Tang Gaozong Emperor and great-grandmother of the Xuanzong Emperor. But she's best known, I'd say, as the noble wife of Li Shermin, the Taizong Emperor. She was also the sister of Zhang Sun Wu Ji, a man who rode out with Li Shermin on that fateful morning of July 2nd in the year 626 when the incident at Xuanwu Gate went down. This was, of course, the coup d'etat led by Li Shermin that saw his two brothers killed, one of whom was the crown prince, Li Jiancheng. And this event was covered previously in CHP episode 129. And Empress Zhang Sun, she came from nobility that stretched back to the northern Wei, but more immediately she was the daughter of a major guy during the northern and southern dynasties period, Zhang Sun Sheng. He was a general who served both during the northern Zhou and the Sui dynasties. And all lovers of Chinese Chengyu might be interested to know Zhang Sun Sheng is the guy behind the story that gave us one of the great Chinese sayings, Yi Jian Shuang Diao, two hawks with one arrow, the Chinese version of our two birds with one stone idiom. This uh, Yi Jian Shuang Diao concerned Zhang Sun Sheng and Sui dynasty founder Yang Jian, a.k.a. Sui Wen Di. Zhang Sun Sheng's other claim to fame was in being Sui Emperor Wen's main go-between with the Gark Turks in the north. If anyone checked out that epic CHP 12-parter on the history of Xinjiang, Emperor Wen had a major hand in the division of the Gark Turks into the eastern and western Kaganets, and it was Zhang Sun Sheng who did most of the heavy lifting in that political event during the Sui. Another thing we remember Zhang Sun Sheng for was his policy of Yuan Jiao Ji Gong, though this was an ancient strategy employed by the state of Qin during the Warring States period. Zhang Sun Sheng cleverly used this Yuan Jiao Ji Gong strategy of befriending distant states while attacking states that were close by in order to cause internal strife amongst the Gark Turks. Empress Zhang Sun, she was born on March 15th, 601 sharing a birthday there with Andrew Jackson. And as magnificent a woman as Empress Zhang Sun was, believe it or not, no one ever bothered to record her name in the history books. So when she's referred to in documents and in literature, when she's not being called Empress Zhang Sun, she got the same treatment as any other woman got who was known by nothing else except her surname. And this was to refer to her as simply Zhang Sun Shi, sort of like Madam Zhang Sun, yeah, she's mentioned in all kinds of official Tang histories, but 
Nobody bothered to write down her name. So I'll just refer to her as Empress Chang Sun, even though she doesn't become the Empress until uh, September 626, a couple months after the incident at Xuanwu Gate. She was not Han Chinese. Her ancestry was Xianbei Mongol. Her family line went all the way back to the Tobas of the Northern Wei during the Sixteen Kingdoms period. Emperor Xiao Wen of Northern Wei during his reign from 471 to 499, famously went all out in the sinicization of his empire, and this is where the Jiangsun surname was created. She was born and raised in Luoyang and had an aristocratic upbringing and was as educated as girls were allowed to get back then. Her father, Jiangsun Sheng, died in 609 when she was only eight years old, and following that... She was put in the care of her mother's brother, Gao Shirlian. Gao Shirlian was another heavy of that era. Aside from later serving as Tang Taizong's chancellor, he was also an aristocrat who served in the Sui. And Gao Shirlian is also remembered as the one who whispered in Li Shermin's ear about striking against his brothers first before they got to him, which of course is what he did. Gao went on to serve the Taizong Emperor up until his death in 647. So in 614, the 13-year-old future Empress married 16-year-old Li Shermin, and they went on to have seven children, three sons and four daughters. And the three sons were Li Chengqian, Li Tai, and Li Zhi. Li Chengqian was the oldest and next in line to the throne. That is, he was the crown prince. As some of you might remember Li Chengqian as the One in his family who really immersed himself in Turkic culture, something that was very much in vogue during the early Tang. And then egged on and assisted by his brother, Li Tai, Crown Prince Li Chengqian would later on, in the year 645, be caught plotting against his father, the emperor, and those two brothers met a most unfortunate and dishonorable end, which then cleared the path for the youngest son, Li Zhi, to become crown prince, and later Emperor Gaozong. So, early in the Tang Dynasty, not only did the Taizong Emperor share this same tragic intra-family rivalry as his father, Emperor Gaozu, he himself endured sons who had this intense rivalry that ended in calamity. So, Empress Zhang Sun, she had her share of family heartaches, and the official court histories that wrote of her life. She's remembered in a number of stories and anecdotes that spotlight her innate goodness, and for being one who never lost sight of the big picture, always serving her husband and setting an example for all to emulate. So, I'd like to run through some of these stories, and we could learn about her in this way. Even before she became empress, when she was still the princess of Qin, She's remembered for her support of her husband, Li Shermin, on the eve of the incident at Xuanwu Gate, and it was written that she herself met with the conspirators, who included her brother, Zhang Sun Wu Ji, who all supported her husband against his two brothers. And on the eve of this most historic of events in early Chinese history, this 25-year-old future empress stood before them all, and, well, I guess you could characterize what she imparted as a kind of a pep talk, spurring them on to victory over those who sought to eliminate her husband, Li Shermin. So the virtue of standing by your man was applied to her and was continually on display through the deeds she carried out for him throughout her life. And after the famous incident was all over and Li Shermin was made the new crown prince, she became the crown princess. But, as everyone familiar with early Tang Dynasty history knows, she wasn't the crown princess for long. And on September 4th, 626, only a couple months past the incident at Xuanwu Gate, she became the empress after her husband pushed Father Li Yuan, Emperor Gaozu, aside and forced him to resign, thereby becoming the Taizong Emperor. 626, what a year in Chinese history that was. So, 626, she becomes the Empress of China, and the legends continued of her kindness, wisdom, sincerity, loyalty, frugality, and utter devotion to Tang Taizong and his dynasty. Their marriage is really one of the great imperial love stories. They were truly devoted to each other. 
and she was devoted not only to her husband Shermin, but to her father-in-law as well. When he was emperor, and even afterwards, she visited him without fail each morning to check up on him, and she was described as someone who genuinely cared for his well-being and made a big fuss with all his attendants to offer him the greatest care and service and to really take care of him. And of course, this was all in line with the notion of Confucian devotion that a daughter-in-law was expected to pay to the parents of her husband. Quite a big deal has been made in the stories that surround Empress Jiang Sun about her thriftiness and frugality. Now, she didn't walk around wearing a sackcloth or anything like that, but much was made about her aversion to spending on luxuries and things that she considered unnecessary or frivolous. Even her own son, the crown prince Li Cheng Qian, one of the noted stories repeated everywhere concerned his wet nurse over in the East Palace. Now, this woman tried to increase the amount of funds required for the crown prince's daily living expenses, and Empress Zhang Sun denied this request, believing the existing budget was sufficient. She wanted to send a message throughout the palace to not be extravagant. She was supposed to have said the only thing the crown prince should be worried about lacking was enough virtues and enough good deeds accomplished. And in a similar incident recorded for posterity, her own daughter as well, Princess Chang Le, was turned down when she formally requested that her dowry be double that of Tai Zong's sister. Dad was an easy touch and willing to give in on that matter, but his chancellor, Wei Zheng, advised him against such a thing and reminded him that there were rules of propriety regarding such matters, and if he went against them, people would talk. And it wasn't a good idea at all. And when Tai Zong consulted his empress on what Wei Cheng had said, she agreed with him fully and praised him up and down for speaking so openly and in the interest of the emperor. And she praised Tai Zong for having such officials as Wei Cheng, who were so honest and upright and willing to speak frankly to the emperor, despite the well-known potential consequences of pissing him off. And I know mothers and homemakers around the world never get any awards or accolades for a job well done, raising their children and maintaining the health, safety, and general well-being of the family. But Empress Jiang Sun had impeccable credentials where this was concerned, and maintaining so much harmony inside the palace allowed Tai Tsung to focus on more important matters of state and not stress out on the kinds of well-known domestic shenanigans that plagued previous emperors. Besides assembling a new government beginning in 626, he had to deal with all these holdovers from his father's reign who gave him trouble. He also had his hands full dealing with the Eastern Turks. Remember, these were the Turks of the Eastern Kaganate. So she's also remembered for being a constant source of sound advice to Tai Tsung. And one of Tai Tsung's most important officials, I just said him, was Wei Zheng. He was an interesting character in that he was actually one of Li Jiancheng's men and served him all the way up until he was killed at Xuanwu Gate. But Li Shermin was so impressed with Wei Zheng, rather than banish him, he brought him into his administration. And when he asked why Wei Zheng sided with his brother Jian Cheng, he was said to have replied to the Emperor Tai Tsung that had Jian Cheng listened to his advice, there never would have been this showdown that culminated in the incident at Xuanwu Gate. And Wei was as loyal as officials came, notoriously rubbing the Emperor the wrong way time and again with his sound advice that would, well, on the one hand, anger the Emperor, but later on would be praised for his insightfulness. And when he died in 643, Tai Tsung regretted not having his wise counsel any longer. Time and again, there were stories of instances where Empress Zhang Sun would step in whenever her husband went on a rant against not only Wei Zheng, but other officials and palace attendants who earned his wrath in the performance of their duties. And anything that had the scent of nepotism or favoritism she would always do the things she always did and hearken back to the past to show Tai Tsung the error in his ways. Like when he wished to make her brother, Zhang Sun Wu Ji, his chancellor, well, she told him it was a bad idea and that there was a strong precedent against doing such a thing. She reminded him about Han Emperor Gaozu's wife, Empress Liu, 
who invited so many of her family members into the government with disastrous consequences. But he went against her advice with regard to Chang Sun Wu Ji, but only put him in this position for a short time. She wasn't someone who involved herself in national affairs, but she took care of the emperor's personal matters, including his relationship with those who surrounded him and reported to him. When she believed he was erring in his ways, she was always there to talk some good sense to him and keep Taizong from falling victim to his emotions. Time and again, there were stories of Taizong ordering punishments and even executions, and Empress Zhang Sun talking to him and convincing him to walk back some of his orders. She avoided getting involved in national politics and only had two pieces of advice for Taizong, to think of danger, even at times of peace, and to choose honest and upright officials and to accept their opinions and advice. Even with his own concubines, she stepped in to protect them, and even attended to some of them personally when they were ill, using her own palace funds when necessary. There's the famous story of Tai Tsong losing his cool once, when his favorite horse up and died suddenly. And for the death of his horse, he blamed the groomsmen and ordered his execution. But once he had calmed down and was himself again, Empress Jiang Sun once again drew wisdom from past stories and reminded her husband of the story of Qi Jinggong, Duke Jing of Qi, who, in the 5th century BC, during the Warring States, wanted to do the same thing to one of his attendants. There's a couple versions of this story. One involves Duke Jing's horse who died, and one that substituted birds for horses. But in any case, this story involved his most loyal and upright prime minister, Yan Zi, also known as Yan Ying. Yan Zi, saw the duke's anger and felt his wrath at losing his horse. So Yan Zi summoned the groomsmen to the palace in Zibo, the capital of Qi, and yelled at him in front of the duke. And he admonished him by accusing this groomsman of three crimes. Firstly, he was castigated for failing in his job, which was to take care of the duke's horses, yet he let one of them die, thereby causing grief and anger to the ruler. His second crime was angering the duke to such an extent that he ordered the groomsman's execution, allowing his own people to see the duke valued a horse's life over a human's. And lastly, Yan Zi berated him for allowing the surrounding states to see the same thing, and that the rulers of these other states would see the duke's actions, which diminished him before all the other states, that being that they'd also see that Duke Jing of Qi was someone who valued animals over his own subjects. So Tai Zong, he got the hint, and thanks to Empress Jiang Sun's intervention, the groomsman was let off the hook. You know, she didn't live very long, only 36 years, and when she was ill and wasn't expected to survive, the crown prince Li Cheng Qian went to his father and suggested, in order to appease the gods, he should order a general amnesty for prisoners and that they should make some donations to various temples. And when his mother, Empress Jiang Sun, heard this, well, she gave the whole thing a big thumbs down. Her reasoning was that amnesties were very important decisions that concerned the whole nation and shouldn't be frivolously used in a way that could impact the judiciary in a negative way. And of course, she was against the idea of throwing money at temples and called this wasteful. In short, she said, if this is heaven's will that she should be sick and die, let it be. And when she died on July 28, 636, the emperor Tai Tsung was distraught beyond words. He had depended on her sound advice since the days when he was still the prince of Qin. He still had 13 years left in his reign and had to make do without her standing behind him, always there to steady him when he went off the rails. She left behind a work of ten scrolls known as the Nü Zi. In it, she wrote to inspire future generations by telling about the lives and deeds of past women in China going back to ancient times. And like a lot of these works from so long ago in Chinese history, this book is mentioned over the centuries and referred to, but no copy of the Nü Zi survived into our day. On her deathbed, she had said to her husband, the emperor, quote, Some members of the Jiangsun family 
have not proved themselves enough, but are enjoying privileges simply because of our marriage. In order to preserve my family's reputation, I sincerely plead you do not give them powerful positions. As your wife, I made no contributions to the national affairs. So please don't waste imperial treasure on my tomb. Bury me under a hill. Use brick or wooden materials for the tomb only, and no treasure inside, please. A simple and plain tomb would be my ultimate wish. End quote. He granted her this request, and she was interred in a tomb not far from where he would lie eternally in the Zhao Ling after he passed in 649. And so affected was this emperor of China at the loss of his beloved he called for a platform to be constructed on the palace ramparts that he would mount each night to look out into the distance where he could view her tomb. Yeah, Empress Zhang Sun, historians, didn't bother to write down her name, but when you hear those words, Zhang Sun Huang Ho, it evokes nothing except the most positive qualities a woman in her position could have. In uh, July of 2016, There was a 45-part series that ran for 10 months that came out on Chinese TV, and it was entitled Empress Zhang Sun. She also appears in popular culture and historical romance novels, and, well, though not a gamer myself, I suspect perhaps she's found her way into one or two of those. So that's the story of one of the great women in Chinese history, a role model for empresses for more than 1,200 years. I should invite Alice Poon onto the CHP one day, and we can chat about the great Qing Dynasty Empress Dowager Xiao Zhuang, who she wrote about in her novel, The Green Phoenix. Okay, let's uh, wrap things up here. This is Laszlo Montgomery, once again, signing off from Los Angeles, welcoming you to check out the two other hit shows of the Teacup Media Empire, the Tea History Podcast, and the Chinese Sayings Podcast. And if I may be so bold, one last shameless plug to go sign up for my Patreon and show me some good loving. Go to my website at teacup.media for details. Take care, everyone, and I look forward to seeing you next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.